many of you have never seen me be fixed dollars? So that's philosophy number one. Wait for the government to change the minimum wage. You say, well, that might take too long. Is there another philosophy? And the answer is yes. Okay. Here's the second philosophy. Wait for the company to pay you $6 an hour. Right? You get a review how often? Every six months, let's say. You missed it. You waited a year. Maybe you didn't make it then. You say, well, no telling how long. If you've got a thousand people with you, maybe you could force the company to change it from five to six. If there were enough of you that said, we will not work, we demand six dollars, or we will not work. By yourself, not a good philosophy. Together with others, it could work. Right? Here's what we call this, the philosophy of demand. I demand more money. Alone, too risky. Together, maybe you could get some progress. So now we've covered three philosophies. Number one, wait for the government. Number two, wait for the company. Number three, the philosophy of demand, which is a bit risky. Here's the problem with the philosophy of demand. You can't get rich. If people only understood, starting at the lower end of the economic scale, that you cannot get rich by demand. Okay. Now someone says, well, in America, how could you become wealthy? And the answer is to develop a new philosophy. And let me give you that. It might be the best I've got for the whole day. It's called the philosophy of performance. The philosophy of performance. I will perform so well, it would be embarrassing for the company not to pay me $6. Then I would perform so well, it would be embarrassing for the company not to pay me $8 an hour, $10 an hour, $20 an hour. So now we've got several philosophies going, and if you want to change your economic future, it starts with your personal philosophy. Now, here's what's interesting in America. I'm sure all of us can think of someone who makes $5 an hour getting started. Can anybody in the audience think of someone who makes $50 an hour? Do you happen to know anyone that makes $50 an hour? Anybody know somebody that makes about that much money? So dot this down now because you've got to teach it to the children because they're not teaching this in, in the ordinary schools. It's possible in America to multiply your income by 10. If you take nothing else home economically to pass on to your children or to someone else, just take that phrase home. Jim Rohn taught us it's possible in America to multiply your income by 10. It's possible. If kids knew it was possible, do you think they would ask, how can you do that? If they knew it was possible, wouldn't the next question would be, how could I do it? If it's possible, how can I do it? Now you just teach them how to do it. How to multiply your income by 10. Now jot this down. A good economic question. Once you've multiplied your income by 10, is it possible to multiply it by 10 again? Not only to multiply it by 10, but to multiply your income by 10 again. Do you know anybody that makes $500 an hour? Can you think of someone makes $500 an hour? Right. My Beverly Hills lawyer makes more than $500 an hour. So jot this down. It's not only possible in America to multiply your income by 10, it's possible to multiply it by 10 again. Do you think kids would be excited to hear this philosophy? I'm sure they would. How can you multiply your income by 10 and then multiply it by 10 again? Now, if you multiplied it by 10 and then multiplied it again by 10, would it be possible? Would it be possible? To multiply it by 10 again. Can you think of anybody that makes $5,000 an hour? What, what do you think I get paid? I mean, this is such exciting stuff. I'm a kid from the farms of Idaho. 
I was 25 years old before I learned that you could multiply your income by 10 and then multiply it by 10 again and then multiply it by 10 again. again. This is mind-boggling stuff. $5,000 an hour. Now, would it be possible? Would it be possible to multiply it by 10 again? $50,000 an hour. Now, here's a good expression to use, especially for this group. You're all tuned in, especially the last couple of days. The best expression is, of course. Could you multiply your income by 10? Of course. Could you do it again? Of course. Could you do it again? Could you do it one more time? $50,000 an hour. You know, I've lectured with uh, General Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell. I had lunch once with Colin Powell, Colin Powell a few years ago. Schwarzkopf gets about $65,000 for a one-hour speech. $65,000. So how could you finally get to $50,000 an hour? Answer? Become a general in the army. <laughs> yes. And lead the troops in the Gulf War. But what I'm trying to say is the possibilities here, let's just say, are just unlimited. You can multiply your income by 10, then you can multiply it by 10 again, and you can multiply it by 10 again. Now, we're only talking economic values. There's all kinds of other values in terms of personal development, but this is it. Now, to climb this ladder... Here's the possibilities. 63 million last year, one person earned. The possibilities, we would have to say, in our country, is what we call unlimited. Now, to climb this ladder as high as you wish to climb it. Jot this phrase down now because I don't think I'll talk about anything more valuable than what I'm about to share with you. Here it is. To climb this ladder economically as high as you wish to climb it, here's all you have to do. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I understood that philosophy, it totally changed my life. I made my first fortune by age 32, starting at age 25. And I've made and lost a few fortunes since then. That one simple philosophy, that it's possible to multiply your income by 10, and then by 10, and then by 10, by 10. And here's the simple way to do it. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Here's how it was put to me. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is fantastic. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune, which is super fantastic. At age 25, I went to work on myself. The difference in my economic future was so startling, even in the early years, that I never went back to the old ways. I never went back to the old philosophy. I never went back to the old disciplines. I accepted the new ones, and it changed my life forever. Unbelievable. Here, here it is in philosophical terms. Just jot this phrase down. This is a good one. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you attract by the person you become, by becoming an attractive person. Now, what could you think of that would start to make you more attractive to the marketplace? This is such simple ABC stuff. Okay? Let me give it to you. Let me start with this. Jim Rohn's view of the 21st century. <clears throat> We've begun a new century, 21. <clears throat> We've begun a new millennium, number seven. Some scholars hold great significance to this seventh millennium. 
and I think it's probably true. It's going to be the most extraordinary time in the history of the human race, I think. And these opening years now of the new millennium and the new century, <clears throat> how could you take advantage of this extraordinary time in human history and make for yourself an extraordinary life? Because it's all possible. So jot this little quote down now. It's one of the best I've come up with, I think, lately. And I'll just quote it slowly so you can jot it down and take it home. Here it is. From testimonials and from personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and build and live an extraordinary life. From testimonials and from personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and build and live an extraordinary life. I'd like to have you think about that, not just here, but even after you've gone back home. Think about it at least often enough to say, I think that's true. From testimonials and from personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible, it's not a guarantee, but it's possible to design and build and live an extraordinary life. Now, if you believe that and accept it, you just simply use that as a foundation, as the fundamentals. So now jot this down. Jim Rohn's view of the 21st century. Number one, unprecedented opportunity. Unprecedented opportunity. These are probably going to be the most extraordinary times in the history of the human race, 6,000 years of recorded history. We got through the last millennium. We especially got through the last century, a bloody century, the 20th century. Hopefully those major wars of devastation and destruction are behind us. World War II claimed 50 million lives. 19 million of them were Russian. The devastation of the 20th century was unparalleled and unprecedented. The savagery was unbelievable. The Holocaust was insanity of the most unbelievable kind. Hopefully that is in the century past. And that we have a new chance in a new century to build a new world and a new country and a new future. With all of the challenges, with Saddam Hussein, with the terrorists and all the rest, once the walls came down about 12, 13 years ago, and I was just in Berlin the other day lecturing and had a chance to go to the Brandenburg Gate, Checkpoint Charlie, see part of the old Berlin Wall. Once those walls came down 13 years ago, the world now has forever changed. Because here's how the history of the human race reads. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Sometimes more difficulty than opportunity. The history of the human race reads tyranny and liberty. Sometimes more tyranny than liberty. But now the world has totally changed. Since communism is on the run, the dictators, most of them are all gone. When I used to lecture years ago in South America, every country had a dictator. Now they're all gone. Castro and a few are left, but that's it. And they will soon all be gone. Within a short little period of the rest of our lifetime, all the dictators will be gone. A new wave of economic uniqueness, capitalism, free enterprise, liberty, freedom, democracy is absolutely sweeping the world. So for a long, dark time, there was more tyranny than liberty. Here's what is unique about this new Century 21. More liberty than tyranny. More freedom than oppression. 
This is an unprecedented time. Unbelievable opportunity. We have the technology to accomplish the most incredible things. We pick up a telephone now and talk to somebody on the other side of the world with ease. It's incredible. We fly, we've got transportation. I get on an airplane, 13 hours later I'm in Hong Kong. Five meals, three movies, and you're there. I mean, it's unbelievable. I leave at 7.30 this evening to fly all night to Orlando to speak to another group uh, tomorrow in Orlando. It's amazing. With the jets, you can cover the world. I fly the Concorde, three hours London, New York. If you fly the Concorde, you can see two sunsets in one day. If you're in London, when the sun goes down, you fly the Concorde to New York, you watch the sun go down for the second time. I told the group at our little breakfast meeting this morning, if you fly the Concorde due west, the sun comes up in the west. If you haven't tried that, you must try it. On the Concorde, you meet unique people. I met Henry Kissinger on the Concorde. Henry said, I had breakfast in Paris. I'm having lunch here in London. I'm having dinner tonight in New York if you fly the Concorde. Before his accident, I met Christopher Reeves a couple of times on the Concorde. Said to my business partner, we're going to be okay, Superman's on this plane. <laughs> this is unprecedented opportunity now, the 21st century and the beginning of the seventh millennium. These are extraordinary times. Now here's number two. However, keen competition. World competition. We're dealing now with Iraq. A big part of it is competition. Hopefully the nations of the world will settle a big share of their differences so we can develop unique economic, social, personal prosperity for the future with limited conflicts. No more horrors, no more holocausts. Hopefully. But with the human race, you always have to keep your fingers crossed. Who knows? But I think it's going to be a time of unprecedented opportunity, but unique competition. Now, to take advantage of the 21st century and this opening of the new millennium, how could you use the opportunity? Mind. Now that you've arrived, told me your story, I'm beginning to see the light. Words. The old prophet said this, words are like a lamp for your feet. So you can see where to walk. And words are like a light for your pathway. So you can see where to go. With words you can show somebody where to step and where to go. Wow. I said a little prayer before I left my hotel room this morning. And asked God to give me a little stronger gift of words today. So that my words might have meaning. Maybe I've caught you at just the right time. Maybe this is the moment for you. And if I can say something uniquely enough, using the English language best as I can, words are sometimes clumsy when you try to express what's going on in your head, let alone your heart. But if I can do a, as good a job as I possibly can in the session we've got this morning and then again this afternoon, by the time I'm finished, maybe my words will help turn on another light for you. And you'll be able to see the possibilities better than you've ever seen it before. You'll be able to see yourself more successful than you've ever envisioned it before. If I can wisely say good words. Now I've put communication in three parts because these, all three of these parts now help me make more fortunes. Here's the first one. It's called training. Training is simply showing somebody how to do the business, how to do the job. If you get good at that, the pay is incredible, whether it's your own enterprise or whether you work for someone else. Training pays big money. Here's the next one, teaching. And I've divided the two just to make the point. Teaching is more teaching life skills, life skills. Teach somebody how to set goals. Gary mentioned, right, making the list and checking them off. Today he gets to check one off. Jim Rohn arrives in San Jose, Santa Clara. I'm so excited about that. Teaching leadership. 
teaching management, teaching how to become powerful, gifted, influential, teaching father skills, mother skills. I've now, the last 15 years, learned grandfather skills. I set a goal when I became a grandfather to be one of the best grandfathers any grandchildren ever had in the whole wide world. I practice it. I think about it. How to use my newfound life as a grandfather and learn every skill possible to dazzle my grandchildren. I'm one of the best. So teach people how to be good fathers, good grandfathers, good mothers, good leaders in the community. Teach a minister how to teach. Teach a minister how to use the gift of language to persuade. Okay. So communication is part of its training, part of its teaching. Here's the best part, no, here's number three in the gift of language, and that's learning how to inspire. Inspire simply means a few simple things. Here's number one. Help people to see themselves better than they are. Yes, sometimes we have to help people see themselves as they are. If they've made mistakes, maybe that needs to be pointed out. If a child has messed up, sometimes you've got to say, you've messed up. But don't leave them in the mess. Now transport them into the future with the gift of your language and inspire them with the person they can become by using the mistakes of the past to develop new disciplines for the future. A teacher I met when I was 25 years old had this unusual gift. He said, Mr. Owen, if you keep learning as you're learning now, one of these days you'll walk into a room full of people and you'll hear, you'll hear someone say, there's the man. That's the man. That's the famous man. I thought, well, that could never happen for me. Sure enough, it did. He said, it will happen. And I think when I walked in here this morning, I heard someone say, that's him. That's the man. That's the famous man. You must transport your children into the future. Yes, you have to take them back to review their mistakes, but don't leave them there. Now transport them into tomorrow. Transport your children into next week. Help them to see themselves 30 days from now, 90 days from now, six months from now. Help them to see themselves successful. It's your gift of language that can do that. Help them to have faith for themselves and faith for the future. The sacred writing says this. Faith comes by hearing words, good words. Somebody who well chooses their words and delivers them with uniqueness can inspire faith for somebody to believe the most impossible things can be possible. And those, that excitement of possibilities comes from hearing or reading unique words. One of the best phrases I could give you for the day here it is, don't be lazy in language. Don't be lazy in language because the gift of language can create a career. It can help somebody see the way into the future. It can help somebody change from who they are to who they would like to be. It will help you to see the gift of your own intellect. There's an, old, there's an innate vocabulary in all of us that helps us to see, helps us to translate what's going on in the world, what's happening, so that we can make good decisions instead of poor ones. We can make less mistakes this year than we made last year. One of the major things to pray for is to be gifted in language because it can have such a dynamic effect on your children. It can have such a dynamic effect on your business. It can have such a dynamic effect on your customers. It can have such a dynamic effect on your business partners that not to continually get better and better at the gift of language would be a great mistake. Let it open doors. Nothing else will open the gift of your language. Let it help people to see possibilities that they cannot see now. And you join in in those possibilities and make another fortune and another fortune. 
all the way up the ladder as far as you wish to go. I don't know how high you need to go. What were the instructions given to the first couple after the garden experience, Adam and Eve, according to the storyteller? We've got some Bible scholars here, I know. Instructions given to Adam and Eve after the garden experience. Here they are. Number one, multiply. It's a lonely place with just two people. Multiply. But here's one now that is so extraordinary, and I'm going to cover a little bit more of it during our ongoing uh, session here today. Here was the second one. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Kind of an interesting phrase. When I lecture in other countries, sometimes it's difficult to find the right translation for be fruitful. Here's what I think fruitful means. Be productive. It might, the example might be a tree, a fruit tree. Plant a fruit tree. Now, why do that? It's very simple. Teach it to your children. Number one, to survive. The first instinct is to survive. So be productive enough to survive. Be productive enough for your own survival. But is that the end of it? And the answer is no, that's only the beginning of it. To produce enough for yourself is only the beginning. What's the rest? Here's number two. Get married. Now you've got to think of ways to produce more than you need for yourself. And guess what that does? It elevates you to a higher life. If you want to live this higher life of a companion, a wife, getting married, see that now changes the dynamics of your future. It's called stepping up to a better life. And to step up to a better life, here's what you simply do economically. You learn to provide and figure out a way to provide more than you need for yourself. You think of ways to provide enough for yourself and for someone else. Why think of someone else? Why not just think of yourself? Because that's a very limited way to live, just thinking of your own survival. If you want to live a more flourishing, unique life, you must think now of someone else. So now the man says, I must produce enough for myself and for my wife. Is that the end of the life experience? No. Now have children. Take a risk. Having a child is like a throw of the genetic dice. Who knows what's going? See what happens. But now a man who now wants the experience of having children must now think of ways to produce enough for himself and for his family. Someone says, why do that? Why not just take care of yourself? Because that's such a, a, a beginning way to live. Survival is okay, but it's not the good life. Now, take it a step further. Jot this one down. A man now figures out, because he's learned now, he's experienced and he understands what life is all about. Now he figures out how to produce more than he needs for himself and for his family. Just jot the word down more. Keep thinking more. How could I produce more than I need for myself and for my family? Someone says, why do that? And the answer is to live a higher life because now you can be generous. Now you can support worthy projects. Is that it? No. Here's the next one. To produce much more than you need for yourself and for your family. Someone says, why do that? And the answer is to live this higher life. What if you earn $10 million one year and you and your family only needed $3 million? That would probably take care of the average family, three million. Some families are more expensive than others, but let's say three million would pretty well take care of most families. But you made 10 million, and you and your family only needed three million. Now you've got seven million to give. Wouldn't you like to live that 
kind of life? Someone says, why do that? And the answer is, the possibilities of economics are so available that if you wish to, you can not only earn enough for yourself and for your family, you can earn more than you need for yourself and for your family, and if you really wanted to, you could earn much more than you need for yourself and for your family. Is that it? Let's take it one step further. Just jot this phrase down. Figure out a way to earn far more than you need for yourself and for your family. Gary talked about Mark Hughes. I met Mark when he was 19. I still do a lot of work for Herbalife around the world. He started this little company when he was 22, 23 called Herbal Life, and he died just a couple of years ago, Mark Hughes, age 44. Guess what he left? Number one, a company worth $680 million, according to the new investors. Here's what he left his son, $350 million. Estimated wealth he created for those who worked for him during the 20 years he was alive, about $3.5 billion. Imagine having the zest and having the wish and having the desire to create billions in wealth, not just for yourself, but for others. 350 million, nice little nest egg for your son. Somebody says, why do that? <laughs> Can you think of the best answer ever? Jot this phrase down, why not? Right? What else are you going to do? Just hang in there until the bitter end? No. Why not see how far up this economic ladder you can possibly go to see if you can't live an extraordinary life? Not just an ordinary life. That's okay. Survival. That's okay. You and your family. That's okay. But if you could think larger than that so that you really go to work on seeing who you could become, in terms of influence, in terms of productivity, in terms of living the little phrase I give you called an extraordinary life. Ordinary would be okay. Extraordinary would be the best. Isn't this good stuff? Couldn't wait to get here and tell you about it. I could hardly wait to hear what I've got to say today. <laughs> okay, so number one, to take advantage of the 21st century, make sure I'm on track here. To take advantage of the 21st century, learn multiple skills. Let me give you one more now. It would be useful to know more than one language. When I travel the world, I have to have translators. The only way I can speak to someone in Japan or speak to someone in South Africa or speak to someone in Israel or speak to someone in uh, um, Europe, most of the time, I have to have someone translate for me. Somebody has to know more than one language to translate for me. And their gift of knowing more than one language makes them uniquely valuable. So that would be... Another wise idea, learn more than one language. And number two, learn more than one skill. Number two, learn more than one language. When I was growing up, my father spoke German. He was German, but he never taught me German. I could have learned it. My mother was English, but she, all, she spoke French, but she never taught me the French. When I was growing up, they said, you know, leave the old world languages behind. This is America now, English, English, English. Now we know much better. My parents, I could have learned three languages as easy as one growing up. So, if you think the time has passed for you to learn that second and third language, make this note now. It's one of the best for the day. Give it as a gift to your children. Encourage them to learn the second, third language, as many as they can learn. I asked a teacher one time, how many languages can a child learn? And she said, as many as you will teach them. They don't lack curiosity. They don't lack capacity. They only lack a teacher. Don't let your child 
develop 10% of what they're capable of. Don't let them develop 15% of what they're capable of. Give them the opportunity to learn as much percentage as possible of what they're capable of. And for yourself. So multiple skills, multiple languages. Now what's the rest? Taking advantage of the 21st century. Jot these notes down. Have you got this? The one that we erased it, if you haven't got it. I've got five key things to talk about <clears throat> during my presentation for the day. Five. Five good basic ideas. These are called basics. Fundamentals. And it's interesting that I only have five. How many fundamentals are there to anything? Here's a good phrase, just a few, meaning anybody can learn them. There's just a few fundamentals to being healthy. If someone says, I want to teach you the 50 fundamentals to good health, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. There's not 50 fundamentals to have good health. There's just a few. Six, seven, eight, that's about it. If you want to learn to play basketball, you've got to learn the fundamentals. How many? Fundamentals are there to the game of basketball? Just a few. Five, six, if you become extremely gifted, maybe seven, eight, that's it. That's it. Now here's what's interesting also about fundamentals and basics. There's no new ones. I mean, this stuff's been around for a long time. So beware of someone who says we've got new truths. Say, no, truth is old. It can be, more of it can be discovered, but there's, there's no new truth. If someone says, I'm manufacturing antiques, wouldn't you be a little suspicious? You know, <laughs> so, skills and fundamentals are like antiques. They've been around forever. The law of averages I teach in one of my seminars, the law of averages. Here's what it says. If you do something often enough, you'll soon have a ratio of results. If you do something often enough, you'll soon have a ratio of results. If at first you talk to 10 people, get one to say yes. That means you're getting one out of 10. Talk to 10 more, get another one. Talk to 10 more, get another one. Talk to 10 more, get two instead of one. Why is that? You're getting better. The law of averages works for anyone. One we've learned for a long time. Here it is. It doesn't ever change. Whether it's a church or a business, 20% of the people do 80%, 80% do 20%. So here's what I learned in time management. You, you can spend 80% of your time with the 20%, not the 80%. You spend 20% of your time with the 80%, 80% of your time with the 20%. It's, you, just, you just have to learn. And these fundamentals now have been around for a long, long time. The 80-20 rule. We bring products, tapes, books, videos, right? Things to buy for your ongoing education. We bring books and tapes and, and CDs and we bring all that stuff for how many people? You say, well, you'd bring enough for 100% of the people. No. 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 20%. You bring all the stuff for the 20%, not the 80. Isn't that fascinating? 20%. It's fascinating, people's different reaction to the same presentation. Someone walks out of my seminar and says, wow, I'm going to go change my life. Someone else walks out and says, oh, I've heard all this stuff before. <laughs> same seminar. It said the first day the Christian church was started, first day, the speaker, Peter, got up 
gave this classic presentation to a multitude, vast number of people. And what was interesting was when he finished the reaction to his presentation, it said some, some of the, I think there were like, there were thousands. It said some of them laughed at him. And I thought, why would they laugh? He seemed sincere to me. And it said some of them mocked him. And I thought, why would they do that? Then I found out they're the mockers. That's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and the laughers are supposed to laugh. It said some that heard this magnificent presentation didn't know what was going on. And they're easy to spot. They're usually saying, what's going on, right? I mean, they don't know what's happening. But then it says this, some that heard believed. And the number that believed was about 3,000. Didn't give us the total, but out of the total, 3,000 said, hey, this is good enough to follow. So that's life. That once you learn the percentages, right? It's called the law of averages. It's one of the best studies. It's in some of my uh, CDs and, and presentations. But now, let's talk about the fundamentals of life, the fundamentals of success. There's just a few. They're basic. It's like ABCs, which I deal with primarily, ABCs. So let's go through them. Here's number one. We've talked a little bit about it by way of introductory. It's called, One, Your Personal Philosophy. Philosophy is a big subject. Political philosophy. Here's what the communists taught, because I have to deal with it when I go to Russia. The communists taught, capital belongs to the state, not the people. We've taught all these years what? Capital belongs to the people, not the state. Wow, what a difference in economic philosophy. The communists said, people are too dumb and stupid and greedy to know what to do with capital. So you've got to take capital away from all the dumb, stupid, greedy people and give all the capital to the all-wise, all-knowing state. And let the state run everything, and let the dumb, stupid people show up for their work assignment. That was the philosophy of communism. They devastated every country they touched with that philosophy. I was just in East Germany. Guess what it's taking just to clean up East Germany after the communists left? A trillion dollars. They've spent 500 billion already, and they got another 500 billion to go just to clean up one country devastated by such a philosophy. Capital belongs to the state, not the people. Wow. The consequences of philosophy are unbelievably either on the good side or on the bad side. Now, personal philosophy. You know, there's religious philosophy and spiritual philosophy and there's economic philosophy and social philosophy, okay, economic, political, all kinds of philosophies, right? Where did we come from and where are we going and what is the meaning of life? Right? Philosophy is a big tent with many different divisions. But the one I want to talk primarily about today and then expand from that is your personal philosophy. So jot this down, one of the best notes for the day. Each person's personal philosophy is the greatest determining factor in how your life works out. Each person's personal philosophy is the greatest determining factor in how your life works out. Your economic life, your personal life, your social life, your spiritual life, all starts with the conclusions you've made in your personal philosophy. We gave the example earlier, earlier on economics. There's three or four different philosophies to choose from in your economic future. Now make this note. Personal philosophy is like a guidance system. A guidance system. And it has to start early. When a child goes to school, they've got to have a pretty good guidance system working. And this guidance system does just two things primarily 
Here's number one. This guidance system helps you to see the dangers over here and try to minimize those or eliminate some of those. That's one of the first orders of human existence is to learn early where the dangers are so they don't swallow you up. Don't devastate you economically, socially, personally, or lose your life. Kids have to get this guidance system working early to spot the signals of the dangers that could wreck their chances to live a good life. Now, this guidance system also helps you to see over here the opportunities so that you could maximize those. So if you learn to minimize the dangers, maximize the opportunities within this working environment now, we call this working things out to live a good life. But you can't possibly live much of a good life if you don't keep learning where the dangers are so you can avoid those and learn where the opportunities are so that you can maximize those. That's about as simple as I can put working on your personal philosophy. Now, why is it this way? Why is life both danger and opportunity? Here's the best advice I can give you. The storyteller probably gives us, you know, more to think about than in detail. But here's what it seems like. And that's one of the best phrases to use if you're going to make your studies and try to come to some good conclusions. It seems like, it seems like, God wished to create for the humans he made a great adventure. Seems like. According to the storyteller, it seems like God wished to create a great adventure for the humans he created. That's the best explanation I've got, seems like. And it seems like God's always wanted some kind of adventure. It said when he was alone in heaven, according to the storyteller, he created all these angels. That must have been fun. Doesn't say how long it took. Doesn't say how many. But evidently, he sought adventure. Part of the adventure, I guess, in those early times before the creation, was in heaven with the angels he created. Now then, he also creates an angel that's the best and the brightest of the angels called Lucifer. And so begins, according to the storyteller, one of the great adventures of all time. And along the way, the idea occurred to Lucifer that he could take over God's place, become God in his place. And he persuaded, according to the storyteller, he persuaded a third of the angels to go with him on this insurrection. So begins an unbelievable adventure. Seems like that's what God wishes, some great adventure. Not just sit up there and float around on a cloud. Create some angels, create Lucifer. Lucifer persuades a third of the angels to go with him in insurrection. Now they lose out, and uniquely enough, according to the storyteller, that God doesn't kill them all. That would end the adventure. But rather cast them out of heaven down to earth. And so now continues this unique story of Lucifer and his, the third of the angels now cast to earth, creates another adventure. Interesting. The Bible is such a fascinating book, giving us seemingly... You know, what God delights in, and seems like God delights in creating this unique adventure. Ancient, one of the ancient stories says God and Satan were talking things over one day. I thought, well, what? that doesn't seem possible. But the storyteller says they're looking down on the earth, and they're talking things over. I thought, wow, that's remarkable. God and Satan getting together and, and talking things over. 
Now, the storyteller doesn't give us many details, so we've got to use our imagination. And on this particular occasion, God got to bragging on one of his favorite creation, his favorite person. It's called Job. He said, Job and I have got this great friendship going. Job and I, we walk together. Job and I plan the future together. Job, Job, Job. Finally, Satan had it up to here with Job, Job, Job. And he said, yeah, God, Job, you've got a wall built around him. I can't get to him. God said, well, what would you expect? He's my favorite person. Of course, I got a wall built around him. Now, they're having this conversation. It's fascinating. Storyteller says, Satan gets this bright idea. He said, hey, God, let's try this. God said, what? If you'll take the wall of protection down from around your favorite friend, Job, he said, I promise you within a short period of time, your favorite friend will curse you to your face. God said, no, he'd never do it, not in a hundred years, no matter what. Satan said, well, how are we going to know? Would you like to make a wager? It doesn't give us the details of the wager. But the storyteller says God picked up the bet and said, okay, let's try it. I'll take the wall down from around my special friend Job. You do your best. I promise you no matter what you do, he'll never curse me. Satan said, the bet is on. According to the terms of the wager, God did take the wall down from around his special friend Job, and Satan then does one of his all-time famous numbers. According to the storyteller, first Satan took his wealth, stripped him of his wealth. Satan said, that'll do it. Where's your friend God? He didn't curse God. Satan said, well, number two, took his health. Below number two. Surely now he'll curse his friend God. No. Below number three, and the worst, took his family. His health, his wealth, and his family. Gone. Satan said to God, here's where he does it. And sure enough, Job's wife comes along and says, Job, looks like your friend God has long forsaken you. You might as well curse him and die. And Satan said, here's where he does it. And God says, well, he hasn't talked yet. And while they both listen, Job says, never would I curse my friend God no matter what happens. God said, I knew it. I knew it and picked up the bet, whatever it was, doesn't tell us. Isn't that a fascinating story? Now, I, I say all of that to illustrate this. It seems like God delights in great adventure. And the only way to have great adventure, it seems like, is to have both danger and opportunity, and us with the possibility of figuring it out. Jot this down. Now, it's a nice little list. On one from other people is to just pick up the signals. Part of it is by sight. Here's a good watchword for the 21st century. Pay attention. No use falling into the same trap somebody else fell into. No use living a mediocre life like somebody else has chosen. Take a look and say, is that what you really would like? Say, no. Here's somebody that never read the books, never made the changes. There was a class and they didn't take it, a skill and they never learned it, a discipline and they never tried it, and they blame the government and blame taxes and blame society and they blame circumstances and all the rest. They don't know. And the key is, watch carefully. Don't you fall into that same trap. That's how we learn from what we see. Here's next. If we learn from what we see, we put some of this on video so you can see it again and again and again. Next, you learn from what you hear. We put it on CDs so you can hear it and hear it, hear it. We don't ask you to come to just one seminar. We ask you to come and listen again, listen again. Here's what the early Christians were taught. Don't neglect the assembly. When we call an assembly, do your best to be there. 
because you never know which of these assemblies is going to change your life forever. You'll never be the same again. And you can't pick the one that's going to totally change your life. You just have to do like all of you I know do. Consistently go, consistently go, consistently go, consistently take notes, consistently go to seminars, and lectures, and all of the rest, because some of them will be life-changing. Maybe this one will be for some of you. The time is right, the words are right, the ideas are right, the moment is here. We don't know. We just come as many times as we can, be affected by as much language as we can, and see what that'll do for our sight and our ambition, our willingness to develop skills, be a leader, influential. Here's the next one. Be a selective listener. Don't just load up on stuff that isn't going to count. We all need a little humor, but not that much. Life is a pretty sober place. It's life or death. It's success or failure. It's flourishing or mediocrity. This is a serious matter. So, make sure that what you listen to gives you the full range, a good diet of things to listen to. The positive, yes, but the negative also. We need to hear it from both sides. Okay. Years ago, I saw an advertisement once on Roseanne. Turn into Roseanne, white chicks talking trash. I thought, oh, America needs more of that. Now, you don't need much of that, white chicks talking trash. Here's a good note. This is a good one. My teacher taught me when I was 25, stand guard at the door of your mind. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what to listen to, what not to listen to, how much time to give to what. Now the third one is important and when we come back this afternoon we'll continue it. But here's number three, read all the books. Now there's millions of books so you can't read all the books. But here's what I mean by read all the books. Read all the books you need to read to make your fortune, become powerful, influential, healthy, prosperous, aware, bright, helpful, partnership, father, mother, grandparent. Read all the books you need for your life to flourish and become the best it can possibly be during the course of your lifetime. Read all of those books. Don't be short on that list. My library certainly won't do it. I've only written four or five books. I'm working now on my fifth, I think it's my fifth book. It's going to be for teenagers and college kids. And I think the title is going to be, Of Course Kids Should Pay Taxes. Of course. It's going to be an interesting book on capitalism, because I teach capitalism now in Russia in very simple form. I might give you a couple of notes on that when we return. I teach kids how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. I mean, it doesn't take long to get into business and make a profit. Here's what changed my life and helped me make my first fortune. Jot this down. The philosophy that helped me make my first fortune. Profits are better than wages. Once I understood that, it was hard to sleep nights the first year. Profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living, which is fine. Profits make you a fortune, which is super fine. And when I started at age 25, I started doing both. Making wages and making profits. Unbelievable. One simple philosophy changed my whole economic future. Profits are better than wages. Read all the books necessary. Now, I'm going to give you some that started my library. I've got one of the best. If you saw it, you'd be impressed. 
haven't read everything in my library, but I feel smarter just walking in it. Right. Okay, Gary, where are you? Enough for the first go around here. We'll be back this afternoon with some more. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate it very much. God bless. Amen. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jim Ryan. Wow, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it.